I think we might make a start and it may be that people join us later, but I don't want to keep you waiting at home for too long. So um, I think we'll get going and say a really warm welcome to you to the Open Spaces community, which although it's minimal on site at the moment, it is vast and growing and you're really welcome to become part of it. Um, and welcome to this at home with Priya and Julian which for me is actually a very special occasion. I've always admired Julian's work and I think he's a fantastic communicator. And I have also great admiration for Priya, um, who I met when she was doing one of our extracurricular modules in our first, actually the first round of it, I think. And I've been really impressed with um, watching her career just go like this. And she's recently won the um, Excellence Foundation Doctor Award for the Southwest of England, which is pretty impressive, and we should be very proud of her. Um, so it's wonderful that they're both able to give perspectives from their different careers and different positions within that. Please have some questions. So as you're as you're listening to them, <laughs> please sort of <laughs> jot down some questions that you might want to ask them afterwards. Um, whatever's sort of prompted by them, you can either put them in the chat or jot them down beside you. Um, so the format for the evening is uh, Julian's going to speak first, he's going to speak for about sort of 10 to 15 minutes, triggered by three interesting objects, just telling you a little bit about pivotal moments in his career trajectory. And then we can, if there are any urgent questions, we'll have a couple of questions then, but then we'll move on to Priya, who will also <coughs> tell us about her career trajectory. And then we'll either break into smaller groups, but I think we'll probably stay within the main group, <laughs> given you're not vast. Um, and try and have a sort of, yeah, sort of unravel some of the ideas that they've sparked and think about what success might look like. So you can think about what success might look like for you, how you overcome disappointment, how you overcome fear of failure and when things don't, don't go according to plan um, and anything else that's prompted by um, the speakers. So I've got two wonderful biographies here. So I'm going to start with Professor Julian Ma and really apologise for my mispronunciation of some of the molecular terminology. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. So Professor Julian Ma, as most of you know, is the Hotung Chair of Molecular Immunology and Director of the Institute for Infection and Immunity at St George's. He also holds an honorary consultant appointment in oral medicine at King's College and an infection and immunity at St George's University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust. And Julian graduated in dentistry, I think there's a little <laughs> clue there, isn't there, in 1983. And he went on there to gain his PhD in immunology, studying topical antimicrobial immunotherapy in the mouth using monoclonal antibodies. This is really, this is really difficult to read. He was a doctoral fellow. Also for me. <laughs> You're going to practice at the Scripps Research Institute, La Jolla? La Jolla. La Jolla in California in the laboratory which pioneered the expression of recombinant antibodies in genetically modified plants. And luckily for us, he moved to St George's in 2003 to explore the wider applications of plant biotechnology for global infectious diseases. And his work focuses on infectious diseases that predominantly affect the poor and developing countries, including HIV, rabies, chikungunya, dengue, Ebola, TB, and now SARS-CoV-2. Um, and you have an extraordinary lab, don't you, here and in other parts of the world. So I'm going to hand over to Julian to give you his insights, and then I will introduce you to Priya when we get to Priya. Great. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. Lovely introduction. And thanks for everybody for coming. Um, so my first object is um, this dental mirror. And um, I drive my wife mad by having um, a plentiful supply of these around the house, because actually they're pretty useful for looking under the fridge and, um, and all these things. But um, obviously I have some affinity for this because it's the first tool of, tool of the trade that I ever had, of course, as a dental student. Um, but I think it's almost a metaphor for the rest of my life, really, because um, my life has been all about looking at things from a different angle. And that's what, of course, using a dental mirror is all about. When you're a dental student, um, the second hardest thing uh, of all of the course is actually learning to uh, use a mirror and to operate uh, in a mirror. And it takes about 18 months for people to learn that and not whip uh, somebody's jaw out by mistake with the super talk drill. So um, 
that's quite important uh, trick to learn. But I found that my research career has been all about looking at things in different perspectives as well. And I think the, su the success and the progress of my career has been around that. So, you know, people are often amused, sometimes laugh out loud when I talk about starting in dentistry and moving into immunology and then going to plant biotechnology. And um, in fact, there aren't many plant uh, scientists around who start off in dentistry. And it's because we were looking at things in different ways. We were trying to find solutions. Um, so one solution we found against tooth decay was to try and put um, antibodies in people's toothpaste. And then, of course, you encounter the next problem, which is that antibodies are horribly expensive to make. And then we found a solution about making those antibodies in plants. And uh, plants, of course, are very cheap and easy to grow, especially around the world. And then I'd say more recently, as uh, in my sort of managerial role, I've also found that um, solving or resolving conflicts also requires you to look at uh, things from different ways. So you are, you know, it's taken me a lot of time to realise that um, when somebody comes to complain about somebody, you've got to hear the other side of it and possibly a third side before you before you act. And um, I wasn't like that ten years ago. I was, I, I tended to rush into trying to sort things out. Um, but yeah, getting getting the full story has turned out to be <laughs> um, uh, a real uh, sea change for me in um, personal um, uh, relationships, I suppose. So that's my dental mirror, and that's why I like to keep one around with me. The second thing I've got is um, a music score, and it relates to one of my hobbies as um, I play in a local orchestra. I play in um, what's called the Wandsworth Symphony Orchestra, a rather grand title for a bunch of crazy amateur musicians, actually, most of us not beyond grade six. But um, I've played with them for 52 years now, and um, so there must be something enjoyable about it. I play the violin, and as I, as I intimated, you know, we are an amateur orchestra in every sense of the word, and I shudder to think what we sound like sometimes. But throughout the 50 odd years, there have been moments when we are playing and um, you get a sort of rush of adrenaline and you're thinking, wow, this is quite good. And um, it's, a, it's a sort of a revelatory moment. And you're in the moment and you're thinking, this is amazing. How are we doing this? And then, of course, the cellos get out of tune or something and then, and then it all disappears. And I just thought that, that those were pretty special moments. But um, last year, we got a new conductor and um, he is a real um, scholar of music. And he finally explained something to us that I had never realised before. And that's why I brought this score, because this, um, I don't know if anyone plays the musical instrument or plays in the group. No, OK, so this score, what it shows is the different parts. So there's actually, this is a very simple score for four parts. So it's got two violins, uh, a viola and a cello part. Um, and what it shows is the harmony that you create by playing together. And of course, as a soloist, you can't do that. But when you have multiple instruments and they tune into each other, then they ha they, they ha they ha you have to be very careful about playing in tune. And one of the exercises our conductor does is he gets us all to play a chord. So there are you know, three notes to a chord. And um, so we'll all play a different note. And it will sound like a chord to start with, but as we continue to play it without any bidding from him, all of a sudden the sound seems to come together and amplify. And all of a sudden we're playing very loud, even though nobody's changed the, the weight of their bow, for example, but the sound has mag magnified enormously. And what's happened <clears throat> is that we've all listened to each other and we've all come into tune with each other. We might not be playing the right note anymore, because probably everyone else is playing the wrong, the wrong note. But because we're all in tune with each other, um, it sounds great. And that's that sort of um, adrenaline moment for me. And of course, there's a physics explanation to it, as there always is. And I don't know if you've ever heard this phenomenon called beats. So if you go and listen to a, an organ and just play two notes on the organ, because the organ is never in tune with itself, 
what happens if you stand so a reasonable distance away while the tunes are playing is you hear this thing going almost like a, a beating thing where the thing goes uh, 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 like this. And it's to do with the sound waves. They are not in sync with each other. But when you get four string instruments playing absolutely in tune or 20 instruments in an orchestra playing absolutely in tune, the, um, the sound waves get into sync with each other. And that's why you get this amplification of sound. So I thought that was a, a really interesting, um, again, sort of metaphor for actually how people should be working together, that we all need to tune into each other. And that's how you get um, the sum of the parts being greater than the number of or whatever that, that phrase is. But the other thing I heard, I've learned from an orchestra is that it's not always the obvious instrument that's the most important. So when you're playing in a string quartet like here, the focus tends to be on the violin that's playing the top tune because that's the most easily heard. But actually the most important instrument in terms of depth of sound and of volume of sound is the bass instrument. And if you take that to an orchestra, it's the double bass and the, um, the tuba who really give you the depth of sound that makes it a great orchestral sound. But if you listen to their parts by themselves, I mean, I, you can listen to double bass, you can't, you can almost not even hear the notes. But as soon as you put an orchestra on top of them, then that notes, those notes become really important. And again, I think that's a, an interesting way of thinking about how groups should work together, that it's not always the stars that make a great group or in my case, a great research institute. It's also, you've got to think about those people who are scrubbing away the background and, and facilitating what everyone else is doing. And so that's what I've learned from my orchestra. That's a fantastic metaphor. I love that. Just talking on sound, are we recording it? Have we? Thank you. So, so going to my third, I thought what I would do is introduce you to my current favourite um, podcast, and it sort of links back to my dental mirror, really. So my favourite podcast at the moment is this BBC one, and it's called The Boring Talks. I don't know if anyone has ever heard them. So this is a series of talks by people who are fascinated by things that, uh, as they say, they find fascinating, but no one else may do. Um, and so the one I was listening to in the car on the way into work today was uh, the one on Asterix puns, because I love Asterix. And... Um, it goes into some detail about the, explaining all the puns that go on in the Asterix books. I'm not bringing this up because I want you all to go away and listen to the boring talks. <laughs> <laughs> but the point I want to make from this is that um, one thing that I say to all my students and everyone else who comes through my lab is that you must go to talks which don't look particularly interesting. What makes a good scientist is to have that open mind that when you go to a talk on a subject that has nothing to do with what you're working on, that you can find the links that will open up a new collaboration for yourself and maybe other people in the room. If you can go to a talk or a meeting and come away with two, three new ideas, that is a successful use of your time. And in fact, I think everyone should go to be able to go to a seminar in this university, any seminar actually, even if it's not in your department, and come away with one good idea that they should take forward. And so I think that's really important that you don't narrow, narrow yourself down to just talks that you think are going to be important or useful to you. Otherwise, I mean, scientists are already tunnel vision anyway um, because of the way we're trained. But all you're doing is you're just narrowing your focus even more. You've got to keep it as wide as you can. And the only way to do that is to hear as wide a number of people talk as you can. So that's why I like doing, I like listening to things like the boring talks because it makes me think about other things uh, in general. I think it's yeah. fantastic. I mean, what a wonderful talk. Thank you. And you haven't finished yet, but <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> beginning. But it is exactly that I think the Open Spaces programme is about, is bringing those different perspectives into your space. So you may think that it's not directly applicable to you, but actually you'd pick something up. And I sometimes go to scientific talks and think, particularly here, that I will understand very little of it. But there's always something that's a nugget or a question or something that may have been meant in one way, but you could interpret another in your own field and you absolutely pick it up. 
Does anyone have any burning questions for Julian before we move on to Priya? And that's the same if, if you want to write it on the chat if you're online. If there's something that's just occurred to you while you were listening to Julian and you really want to ask him, uh, do you want to ask him now? Sorry, you'll have to tell me if there's anything coming to the chat. Mm -hmm. Since there's not, well, in that case, can you really think about what you've just heard and maybe digested it and see if there are if there are threads you'd like to pick up with um, Julian when Priya's finished speaking? Because I think it's something that I think links in really nicely actually with Priya's when you were talking about looking with your first instrument was looking at things from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was thinking that links in so much to what I know about Priya's, um, Priya's career, where she started off with so many sort of, as you'll hear in a minute, so many sort of different trains of interest, which I'm sure have fed you as a clinician, you know, and, and fed partly into you getting that award. And I was wondering, apart from you being an example, how do you think students gain the skill? of actually looking at it from different perspectives, because it's actually quite hard, isn't it? Because one tends to be quite defensive about one's own perspective, or a perspective you feel sort of um, sympathetic towards. Mm. I think it is, uh, it, it is difficult, isn't it? And I think they gain it primarily through um, seeing good examples. So, you know, if you are a student's mentor or a student's supervisor, then it's incumbent on you to show that example by going to the seminars and taking your student to places that um, you know, challenge them as well. So I think that's probably one of the most important jobs a mentor can do. That's fantastic. It's a very nice segue into Priya, who I think is a wonderful example. I'm probably biased because we're all very proud of her, but I'll tell you a little bit about what she's done um, <clears throat> before she tells you more about her sort of reflections on it. So Dr. Priya Kadam, she completed her BSc in psychology, followed by a short time working in a psychiatric hospital. And she then embarked on an MSc in neuroscience at King's, which she describes as an unforgettable experience, which broadened her horizons with her knowledge, but also this appetite for further learning, which I think really segues for, on from what she was saying. And then she completed her MBBS at St. George's, becoming president for the Clinical Neuroscience Society, and completing a diploma in the history of medicine from the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries. And she describes her time at St George's as colourful, where she was enrolled in the medical humanities module, which is where I first encountered her. And she was actually a wonderful member of that first cohort because she always came up with interesting questions or interesting perspectives and was a really wonderful member of that group where students from George's were learning alongside humanities students from Birkbeck. Um, she was also involved with costume design for a fashion show and she helped facilitate neuroanatomy teaching. And she graduated during COVID, which must have been another interesting challenge. And since then, she's worked as a foundation doctor with an interest in neuroscience, neurology and neurosurgery. And she's going to be talking to us about the challenges of working in the workplace within the existing NHS structure, but further burdened by COVID and what the challenges are in rising to that as a newly qualified doctor with sort of fairly unique experiences and she's going to explore some of that with you today so oh, thanks thank Deborah. You. yeah <laughs> bit nice words and nice little summary um, really nice to be here um, i think by the way because the last time i saw this lecture theater was when it was being built and i was running outside up and down in the corridor thinking i'd be really nice to go in for a talk or something but i have to go to this ward and do this or finish my sign up for my mbds so it's, it's really nice to be back. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a couple of objects and then I'll spin you into some sort of stories and tales. So um, the first thing I'm actually just going to show you is, um, I've all seen these before, but um, it's my one piece of technology, is my iPad, which I brought along, which many of you might have at your desk or similar. Um, so when, when COVID happened, I was in my final year at St George's and we had a lot of academia exams, as well as placement bits to, to kind of tick off, really. So we'd pass the course and we would finish. And I thought, OK, I feel like I'm running out of time here because I'm wanting to engage and learn. And at the same time, we've got these new hurdles. We've got um, a, a new disease, essentially, that's sort of taking over, new protocols in place, masks, um, only so much patient contact you can have. How am I going to complete this? And how am I going to engage with 
my senior <coughs> clinicians um, fulfill all of it on their side and as well fulfill my own learning because I've got my own um, own goals and own, own sort of um, things I'd like to get to for myself. So what I used to do was I used to take my iPad onto the board and um, I used to screen print um, prescribing questions for the prescribing exam and I used to go on and in the ward round where you're largely an anonymous medical student um, and then say, you know, is there any questions or anything anyone would like to say? And I'd say, oh, well, actually, I have a question. And then I would open it up and say, and I have this question regarding prescribing a, a Pixaban for a uh, for an ischemic stroke or something like this. And then we would have sort of a five minute kind of window where everyone would go, oh, OK, oh, I'm not sure. And then the junior would say, oh, I just done my prescribing exam last year. Something like that came up or someone else would say, this is not relevant. We are on a kidney ward or, you know. Um, something like that but it began to be my way in um, to actually sort of promote some engagement and that was your way to to talk to people as well because as a medical student you desperately want to be part of a team you desperately want to feel like you're contributing and at the same time you're learning and to strike that balance um, can be quite an art so I felt that having something that was central that we could promote a discussion would be quite useful and I didn't want to wait for that one time in the whole placement where you presented a case to the group and then you got your sign up and you left. Um, so what I did was to carry carry around this iPad with me, like sort of wander arm, looking a bit corporate but not corporate at all, um, for the duration of the COVID placements and I carried on in that fashion asking questions and demonstrating, showing images and um, felt a bit like a salesperson at times. Um, and I carried it on for the foundation years. So I got used to carrying this around. So what I would do was have a look at the case on the ward or a patient we'd be looking after. And then I'd look up something to do with that case. It might be um, the, mole the, the molecular pathways. It might be some pharmacological management. It might be something about the clinical symptoms, something. And I'd have it there. And at the end of the ward round or some quiet spot in the afternoon, you'd kind of you'd bring it out and then you'd have a chat about it because it took too long to log onto the computers on the walls because they were too slow um, and everyone's really busy and they've all got all got their moment so I, I would I would use this as my this was my tool so it wasn't just something to to look up things it was to promote engagement and I'd say that that's something that sort of stayed with me is I think not just something as a med student or a foundation doctor but just something for kind of life I always have something in the in the background so that's my, my first object. And for tips for anyone who's um, a final year student or just a, sort of on the brink of F1 is have something like that ready to talk about when you get a quiet moment with seniors because they'll be, ha they'll be happy that you're engaging and you'll feel like you're getting more out of it um, and you'll bring some sort of flavour and something like that to this work environment right now which is very sort of challenged with staffing in all areas of the country um, and we've got you know, recent industrial action, we've got things that are being noticed, changes that are coming up. And I think in times like that, you want to maintain your roots, where you came from, why did you go into medicine? Why are we working in this way? You know, the greater good of patients, what is your interest? Still spark yourself and you spark other people. So that's my first object. Um, my second object is a little more lighthearted, really. Um, so we have a bottle of Chanel uh, Coco Mademoiselle. Uh, <laughs> so, do you need to sample it? Would you like? Come on. Have a smell. Have a smell of the spray. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so when I was a med student at George's, we got given a locker, and at first I thought it was a bit American, and I was very excited by it. Later I realised that it just got stuffed full of things, and that you, when you actually want your dissecting room lab coat. Thank you. It's right at the bottom of the pile of the locker. Um, but I felt like we were in London and anything could happen. And I still have this mentality, even though I'm not in London. Um, so I used to keep a pair of high heels and a bottle of Chanel <laughs> in the locker. I didn't use the, the high heels very much, but I did use the Chanel, especially after various sessions running around clinical seals, dissecting room, <laughs> different things. Um, so the reason I'm showing you this today is because I feel the world of medicine, science and healthcare is very fast paced um, and to be prepared for anything. And you can springboard from your working life into your fun personal life, vice versa. Um, and to sort of honour both of them, to always have that in mind, because 
I feel that both of those sides make up the same coin and that make me up. I know that I'm a better clinician and a happier person when I have more balance in my life. And um, that's that represents the fun bits, the be prepared bits, and that don't don't give up part of yourself to do your job. Try and maintain who you are in all ways when possible. So that's that are one. you wearing high heels? No. No, I'm, I'm, I'm running around wall this morning, so <laughs> flat shoes. Do you want to try the both of you? You want to come see her? It's not such a thing. I'm a bit of a connoisseur of Chanel. So. Do you have enough? Because you. <laughs> yeah, I do. Don't worry. I have a. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's going down well here. <laughs> oh, it always got nice comments about it, so it yeah. stayed, and I didn't change the choice in the locker. Or anything. Yeah, and don't think you smell when when people have been traumatised that you smell to bring people back into the room again, don't they? Maybe so you're bringing yourself back maybe into like a nice space. stress um, therapy, mm. the psychology side of things. I don't know enough about it. I used to have a friend who tried to learn anatomy by putting a different smell on every page, but I mean, it just <laughs> her Grey's anatomy just not disgusting. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it smell like a perfume shop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My first ever job at 16 was working for body <clears throat> shop. Um, in Gatwick Airport, so I'm from Sussex, and uh, the, the airport was like a shopping mall to us. Mm. At the time, you had a, um, a lot of shops before you went airside, before you check in with a passport and drop your bags and things. And um, whenever I walked in, you had all the clashes of smells. I'd leave, I don't know what I smelled like when I left, and I had to smell um, coffee beans afterwards because your smell, your senses would be so overwhelmed yeah. and you had to clear it. Research, research yeah. Yeah, mm. so I ended up doing that. Um, okay. Um, and you have and another object. I have, I have one more. Um, and then I just thought, mention a few sort of tips and interesting bits from the foundation program. So, um, so <laughs> I brought a blanket with me on purpose. Um, so it was this blanket, because I think the one I used was too worn out. In the final year of MBBS, going from that sort of COVID transition, being a medical student to being an F1 doctor, still in COVID, um, I actually ended up moving eight times to complete the final year. So your placements were meant to be in certain places, but if the COVID burden was too high, they relocated you somewhere else. Sometimes, I think five or six of that times, it actually meant moving house. So I was living out of a suitcase a lot. I didn't bring the suitcase with me, that's probably in tatters somewhere. Um, but I ended up sleeping in kind of odd places between moving. Sometimes you had to be at St George's for a lecture or something like that. Sometimes you had to be on placement, it might be on a, an overground train back into London. And so I used to travel with an extra bag with a blanket with me. And I have to say that I think um, due to the gift of being able to sleep anywhere, <laughs> this, sort, this sort of saved me. And I think I was able to recharge. So when I do journeys, I still carry a, um, a blanket with me. Those sorts of things. Uh, I never underestimate it for my whole professional life now. Oh, you have to find your own version of the blanket that yeah. comfort. So how did you sleep on it? So. <laughs> have you read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? No. So the major recommendation there is never go anywhere without a blanket. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, second, I, I definitely second that now. So you were living um, proof. So were you yeah. going to give us some top tips for medical yeah, students sort of actually going into a professional I thought workforce? I would. Because such a changeable time, we've, we've got industrial action happening, we've still got this solid foundation programme that's in place, and we've got medical studies, and we've still got hurdles and tick sheets to do. So um, I can pull sort of a, a list of a few tips that I thought would be very useful. What would I have liked to know a couple of years ago? So the first one is um, knowing how to do a cannula in the middle of the night when there's no one else around <laughs> and your duty for anaesthetist is in theatre and says, I'm sorry, I can't come. I have someone open on the table. Please try and sort this out yourself. So that's a very busy moment. And if the patient's very sick, you might need IV antibiotics. It might be that the cannula's actually fallen out or they've moved, something's happened. Um, and, and everyone else is sort of tied up and you think, OK, if I have this skill right now, I could just go and do it. And um, we've been lucky where I've worked. We have um, 
uh, an acute care team, we call them, who are um, an eclectic mix of professionals who um, shat, sort of run parallel to our medical registrar and our medical team that add as an extra line of support for such things. Sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't. So you can give them a call and say, oh, you know, I'm struggling with a cannula, please come and help me. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. So my recommendation is if you're still on placement, um, even if you've ticked off your competency of doing one cannula, do a few of them um, and become confident at them as when you see if, see if anything, I, yeah, I can do that. That's, that's my first thought. Um, my second point I've already touched on, which was about the iPad and engagement. So you don't have to go out and buy an iPad or, uh, you, or you don't have to just say buy a laptop, but take something with you onto a ward every now and again in the speciality you're working in to promote engagement of your team, have something else to talk about. Um, and it helps you with build a relationship, I think, with your seniors as well. I think one of the things they still want to see is despite the hurdles of, of COVID protocols changing, uh, treatment ladders changing, they, they want to see you still interested in what you're doing, what you set out to do. Um, and that's actually one of the ways um, that I, I think I became more interested in areas I, I didn't think I would be because it generated discussions we wouldn't ordinarily have had. Um, and I think that led to, to the award that I, that I very nicely received because I went about things in a slightly different way. I just thought that, that links with your talk, Julian, I think, is how can I look at this from another angle? I have a nine to five shift. I have a nine to five shift all week, different doctors, all from different areas. Um, I can go in, do my bit, do the jobs, escalate, care for patients and go home. I've also got this list of things to tick off. And why do I feel like after two weeks that... I haven't really got my teeth into my subject, but I've kept everyone alive. And I thought, well, I've done my bit for them. I've done my bit for the ward. How am I going to facilitate my own learning and maybe for other people as well at the same time? So my advice is take something in, take some written work you've done, take a diagram, take anything and draw people's attention to it. Have a chat. Um, also bring cake. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that's what we've got today. But that, that's, always a good, that's always a good one. Um, my next piece of advice is don't expect to be or don't put pressure on yourself to be perfect because I think we go through medical studies and you know maybe university training in general hoping that and wanting to be you know the best we can be get the top grades if you're around other competitive people you're naturally going to be more that that way inclined medicine is that way inclined you know you've got a lot of very high achieving people from school previous studies have all come together in one room so it can go one of two ways you might talk or you really might not um, and I think we leave as well thinking okay you know we we want to know what we know but when you're in the working world it's okay to not know and in fact that might bring more strength to you as a person and open up different avenues for discussion and learning whereas if you go in sort of thinking I or oh, I should know it and I don't there's no such thing there's, there's no such thing in the working world that you should know it because you're thinking about patient safety and it's better to ask a question and no question is really silly so that's one of the things kind of I've learned is don't worry about what you know or don't always ask if you're going to a new hospital definitely always ask and clarify things and it will help broaden the horizon and someone else will probably put their hand up and say oh I didn't know that either or thanks for asking that so that's, that's my my three nuggets. I think that's a fantastic tips actually because you're quite right that, <clears throat> that medical students go through with, a, with incredible sort of perfectionist. I mean, I don't know if it's the same in biomedicine, and it probably is in all of academia, but that to fight against that perfectionism and sort of not being able to admit when you don't know something as well or, or being able to just do something that's okay and not absolutely brilliant. It's massive pressure. So it's, it's really, really valuable hearing you say that. Do any of you have any questions now for Priya and for Julian? Or if Julian has any for Priya or Priya for Julian? But I was also thinking, if there are any students who were online, um, if you wanted to put something in the chat, Sarah will feed it into the room, because it would be lovely to hear from you. Now is your opportunity to ask Priya something, or Julian something, or ask him about his wonderful work, which he's only skimmed over. <laughs> but do, do you have any questions? Are you jotting something down? I see some questions in the chat. Oh, hi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I can't see so them. From Dirk, um, 
to Julian. Do you think everyone should learn how to use a dental mirror? <laughs> Did it help develop any other transferable skills? So it's a, I think you'll find um, it's a real life skill. And anytime, <laughs> the last time I used it was at the weekend, actually, when I was trying to fix the plug. And it is impossible to get under a sink and to work out how a plug works, one of those lifting plugs, without one of these things. Also, um, last week, I was trying to find a dead mouse, actually. And uh, we knew it had gone under the fridge. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm using these things all the time. Um, I'm sure you will find uh, numerous ways to use as well. And actually, just looking in a mirror, is, it's quite an interesting experience, actually. I, I, I've realized that um, people's uh, image of themselves is uh, the view in a mirror, because that's the only time you see yourself. And I think that's why nobody likes their own photograph being taken, because the photograph is actually not the view they normally see. <clears throat> it's what everyone else sees, but they see the mirror image. So learning to look in a mirror is uh, a really good skill. I recommend it. There was an Agatha Christie plot, wasn't there, with the looking in the mirror, that she no. saw herself the wrong way, wrong way yeah. around. Um, but but look, it, it also goes back again to your wonderful thing about different perspectives and different people, maybe as well as different perspectives, bringing mm. different things to the team, which which I think you, you talked about as well. There is actually something also I learnt recently, and that is I had a stroke in November. And um, when I was going through my rehab, one of the things that um, techniques they use is to get you to learn to work in a mirror. So they put a mirror up and it's almost like you can copy your, your movements. So um, I was struggling to get used to my right hand again. And so somebody told me to do this trick and um, it was really useful. I learned, so I managed to start writing again um, fairly quickly by, by doing that. That's, that's amazing because wow. I know they, they do those as mirror boxes for phantom yeah. pain. Yes, was exactly. it the same sort of yes, technique exactly where you put it in? And, mm. and do you feel like you're doing what you see you're doing? Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. God, so that suggests that how we see ourselves or mm. see our bodies actually impacts on how we are, how we move our bodies. I just think it's actually it's easier than if there was someone sitting opposite you saying, move your right hand this way. And they'll, they'll, of course, be moving their right hand, so you see it going across. Mm -hmm. But it, what you need them to do is move their left hand in the way they... And that's what you're doing in the mirror, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. just thinking about your mirrors, one of the best things I did for me was to do Zumba class, oh, where yeah. they're dancing, oh, yeah. Yeah. because the instructor is in front of you, and you're in these rows watching yeah. them, and they're moving one way, and then you yeah. have to move that way, but it looks like the other way, and then if they move forward, you have to make sure you move yeah. forward. <laughs> exercise for the cerebellum yeah. and, and the mirror neurons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true, which, which is also like you're talking about playing in an orchestra and mm. I think also because you're you're sort of listening to what everyone else is doing, aren't you? Mm. So as, as you say, it's sort of like your team and there's, so it's like you're having you're having a lot of different focuses at the same time that you're playing a piece of music, you're concentrating on your part but mm. you're also listening to everyone else's part. And you're look, looking at the conductor, presumably. Yes. So that that must be <laughs> <Sometimes>. very. <laughs> Another part there of the conductor. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So I was thinking that's got real, real parallels with it, with the team, hasn't it? And I loved your idea that the that the the line, like the the violin line, or the sort of apparent star of a, of a team, is not necessarily mm. the most important. The, the person that's holding that that team mm. together or that work together which sort of strikes in with some of the things you were saying. Do we have any other questions from students online? So there's one from Dirk, um, still, to, to Priya. Mm. Uh, apart from your iPad, how else did you develop relationships with your placement team? Mm. Um, that's a good question. Okay, so I think you mentioned it before, but food. <laughs> so um, if you have that sort of team <coughs> that are quite chatty and get on quite well, you might take it in turns to do sort of a, a Friday cake thing or you go for lunch together or if you're too busy as a team you could order in lunch together that sort of thing so I think that builds relationship something fun and something nice um or even sort of outside of work and socials um but to, I think to get to know seniors find out what their area of interest is and I think find out something about that area and have a discussion with them because I think like Julian said you don't know where that might lead you might think I'm not interested in that at all, but actually the concept might be something that holds true. 
or they might know someone you do or recommend something for you and that conversation might lead somewhere else. So I'd say take an interest in things other people um, think, think are interesting. It's one of the biggest problems with teams actually and um, online meetings. So, you know, scientific conferences have really taken a dive in the last few years and everyone is now going online. Mm -hmm. But what that does, it, mm -hmm. A, it means that you can zone out when you don't think you're interested. Uh, but more importantly, you just don't have those chance conversations mm -hmm. that, you know, having a piece of cake together will provide. Mm -hmm. And um, I really do worry about uh, younger scientists now who are, are getting used to go to meetings online. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful because they can go all the way around the world, go to any conference they like for very little money. Mm -hmm. But they're not experiencing that um, mm. those wider perspectives. Don't you think, Julian, it's the same issue here, just walking around the corridors and mm. yeah. those chance meetings. It's the five minutes before a meeting starts where you're mm. getting a cup of tea or whatever, yeah. where you mm -hmm. develop the relationships, and it's not just the business of the day. That's absolutely it right. Seems yeah. quite empty in the past. Mm. But I work in the library, so and there's always lots of people in the library. And we have quite a high on-site presence, so we've managed to keep our team as quite a, a tight and strong team. Mm. But um, but I don't feel that I went up to the sixth floor the other day for something and it was deserted. Yeah. Not in your area actually. No, now there's usually a few people around, but I, um, but in the other areas. It's really You're so different. right, Sue. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what makes us tick, isn't it? It's mm. what you said about having a reason to talk. To people, mm. and what I was going to add <laughs> is that I mean, you're obviously very highly motivated in, in the medical side. For me, I go to quite a lot of meetings and quite a lot of meetings with people who are much more senior than me that are bringing different things to the table. And I used to find it really, really difficult to engage at those meetings. I sit there feeling really worried about having to speak or even say my name, you know, when you go around the room and introduce yourselves. And I realized that just having something to say in the meeting. So picking one of the papers and just reading it in a bit more depth than the others and having a question to ask and to mm. kind of break down that barrier and suddenly you are part of the meeting rather than an observer at the meeting and you can totally do things there. That's really interesting, Sue. But was, do you, I mean, is your experience that almost students are losing that ability to have those chance conversations mm -hmm. or to bump into each other in the way you're describing so that it's not difficult for you to open up a, a conversation but if you've only been used to meeting or learning online where the conversation is much more orchestrated and it's more sort of an organized thing where you, you have to sort of put your electronic hand up and then be allowed to speak and things it's just very different do you think people are losing those skills which might then make it more difficult for them coming to the workplace and particularly if people are not naturally extrovert are there, are there ways you found around that or do you think young people find their own ways around it outside training and um, a mixture so i think if you have been in the world before and you were used to going to in-person meetings and you've cultivated some of those skills already I think what you're doing is adding to your repertoire of how you interact. And I think we possibly will miss the old way because we're people and we're community and, you know, that's how we, we feel, essentially. It's, it's useful to have the odd sort of online meeting for time management and things and get a bit more done. But I think if you're 18, 19 and you're coming into the workplace, particularly medicine, medicine is a human subject. You have to examine people, you know, you, you discuss in person and often you have a, a better idea of how people... Um, uh, sort of saying what they mean and conveying their opinion in person rather than through text you can, it can construe so many meanings. So I think if you've come straight from school and then you're going straight online, they're very human subject. I, I think that there are skills that won't be cultivated and then if the world continues to move that way perhaps they, they won't be um, and I think people would miss out. Yes, I think online meetings work well for groups that already know each other. So, you know, the kind of meetings that we go to now in senior management, we've known each other for a long time. So those meetings still work well. But I'm thinking about the new research meetings, you know, small collaborations between three teams where we all meet online. And I don't have any affinity for the PhD students on the call. I, you know, don't know who they are. They don't talk during the meeting, of course, because it's you know, more difficult. So I wouldn't even recognise them in the street. 
but you know, one in person in person meeting would fix all of that actually. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't need to be a meeting, Julian, it could be yeah. a TK, yeah. it could be a, a yeah. Yeah. contact in the collaborations place mm -hmm. so that then the meetings because mm -hmm. it's those things, it's the the kind of intangible things that oil the wheels that yeah. make us and connect us as people mm -hmm. and they care, mm -hmm. they care about mm -hmm. what happens rather yes. than it just being you know, a formal process. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right about that care because you care for a human being who you, you know or is physically in the room with you, it's almost wired into us isn't it, but do you care for a circle on a screen that disappears in the same way? We do care for you. Putting attendance through them maybe there. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think it's interesting you bring care into it because that gets lost, I think, sometimes. Were you going to ask a question before? Because you were scribbling away. Uh, you never got to ask a question. Shopping list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how late is it? Uh, no, I'm just, I was interested in, because you used uh, the language of music, and then I was thinking about the language of plants, and you talked about collaboration, so I was interested how you make language inclusive, or how you build that kind of shared rapport with people through language, if you have any advice on that. It's a question for both of you, really. Gosh, um, I've never really thought about that, actually. Um, but perhaps I will mention one bugbear of mine. <laughs> And that is um, in, in the good old times when we were still part of Europe, um, we were engaged in a lot of European uh, research collaborations. And um, one of the things I, I noticed is that there is this European version of English where um, so people from Spain, France, Germany, they all speak English very well, but they don't quite um, speak it accurately and often they're not particularly clear. Well, I would say they're not particularly clear what they're saying, but they all seem to understand each other because they have this version of English, which is the scientific European English, I would say. And I noticed as people in my group sort of morphing into that style of English as well. So although the universal language of science is English, in those research collaborations, we were all talking a slightly different language, which brought, brought in things like what I think um, some ambiguities into our language, which is very unusual for science, actually. But it's because, you know, the way you say this in Spanish does have some ambiguity and they would do a literal translation. And we also morphed into using that. So I, I called it Euro English in the end. And that's what I think we all talk when we go to meetings. We, <laughs> we don't stick to proper English, which I think is a bit of a shame, but it seems to be easier um, for people to follow. I know Kai is on this call. I don't know if you've come across this phenomenon as well, Kai. Or is he gone? No. Is Kai there? Yes. Okay. Do you want to, you can either put your microphone on or, um, or put it in the chat, whichever you'd rather, Kai, but it'd be interesting to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's quite, quite interesting. interesting. Because as a non-English native speaker, you are always a bit in in the losing moment if you talk to an English speaker because you feel mm, on the beginning a bit inadequate if it comes to some, you know, especially if it comes to some emotional important things, you really uh, want to bring across and you may miss the... the um, the right words so you miss the context or so it is an interesting to to that not many people in the uh, UK may appreciate that everybody else needs to learn English in order to communicate right so um, and there's always this kind of drawback that you have when if you're not living in the UK and you know you're, you're getting so used to it, um, so there is always an interesting concept, and um, you can clearly hear people from different countries, you know, what their English sounds like, as Julian says. So um, I find that it's if I write, for example, grants here in the UK, my English needs to be super top notch. <laughs> 
if I've read the same stuff in, in Germany, you know, if, it doesn't need to be that top notch because it would be good at, at that stage. So, um, yeah, it's a challenge sometimes. Um, but I think between all the non English speaking countries, you can really communicate as Julian says much easier because everybody is a little bit unsure and you try to understand use simple words um, and that um, it's kind of it brings you also also together because you're both in the same situation right you want to try to communicate um, and um, connecting by by having maybe not the right words at the moment but you know you're trying and you're engaging and so there comes a moment of a connect um, beyond the language, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I was on an EasyJet flight the other day, actually, and um, the uh, air hostess gave an announcement in a fairly thick French accent, actually, and I'm sure I was the only one who didn't understand what she was saying on the plane. She was perfectly comprehensible to everybody else who was from France, Belgium, Germany, on the plane, except for me. <laughs> but is this, what, what I was wondering, actually, what you were saying as well, is that also that maybe there's, you said something about a community and you were saying this is sort of trying to understand each other, coming mm. together, and almost mm. allowing some ambiguity in order to understand each yeah. other. Yeah. And I sometimes wonder that if we speak English as our native language or our, our first language, that we think, we assume that we're all talking about the same thing mm. when we use the same word. Mm. But I'm actually not sure that we are. But we, because we assume we are, we don't bother to try to sort of mm. come together and mm. understand in that, in that sort of way. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a bit like images. We all interpret them differently, but we know we interpret images differently. Whereas I think with language, we don't think we interpret it differently. We think we interpret it the mm. same. And mm. I think that does leave a, a lot of misinterpretations. Mm. So I'm quite interested in both your takes on having a language where you're all hedging around it, but you're really willing each other to understand each other. Yeah. I have a question. Excellent. Sorry. 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 Um, I think it will lead into a question, but I'll just uh, pick up on that. As a Southern European English speaker, not native, um, I understand what you say when you talk about that communal English. However, I would say that maybe depending on the clusters of the language, the languages that people speak, that will have different affinities mm -hmm. between, for instance, maybe Latin speaking, you know, Latin languages. Uh, will have that affinity and then Germanic languages will have a different affinity and so on. So I think these are different clusters that maybe will find that um, affinity in how you use language, which I think can also have a lot of potential for native English speakers who are not often used to, in terms of how they hear, you know, they have to get used to that um, elasticity in language and listening to different accents and different mm. Englishes of yep. um, people. So I think that has a lot of potential in terms of maybe even the possibilities of language and expanding how you can express even very objective things, maybe such as science mm. or, you know. Um, so that's quite interesting, maybe, in t you know, when you have these research projects that bring all these different people together. Um, so I guess this is not so much, or maybe the question is, yes, do you think, do you see that as having potential to expand? Oh, how definitely. People express themselves and how mm. people convey maybe the work that they're doing in science or medicine. Or definitely. Anything. Because, I mean, English is a famously a very elastic language, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's probably... Exactly. But yeah. for instance, sorry to interrupt mm. you, it, it is very elastic, and yet I don't think native English speakers take advantage of that. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you have yeah. the most number of words and yet they're not used, only a very small percentage of them are used in English language. Quite possibly. But I think the influence of um, Europe, well, non-English native speakers is, is very important. And I'll give you one example in my field, actually. I, I work in gene editing, this CRISPR-Cas technology, and the word, the noun for gene editing, for some reason, has become addition. So people will talk about the addition of this, um, uh, of this cell has been this. And I, Two years ago, I was sitting there thinking, no, that is not the right word. You are using the wrong word. But now it's become it's become the word that everybody uses in science. So um, 
that I think that is the influence of um, of pressure, actually, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Even I used it the other day to my aura. <laughs> <laughs> but does that make it more precise because everyone understands it, mm. or does it allow for an ambiguity in, in all the people in that community? Well, you're using it because you think that's the easiest way that everyone else will understand what you're trying to say, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what changes English so much is um, people change the way they use. The, you know, I mean, who cares about apostrophes now? But you know, we change that because we want the most people to understand as quickly and easily. I do that with, um, when I've had surgery jobs especially, the thing I like mm. about surgery is that you're working on, you're giving your time to a patient as a team, and you're coming with a plan together. Um, and you're looking at the imaging together, and you're sharing that understanding by looking at it, pointing at it, discussing it. And you have to want all be on the same page about what's going on, what's the plan, and what we're we actually doing. And, Where's the problem? Where's the lesion? Um, and that side of things. And sometimes I feel like medical language will take you so far because you've all learnt most of the things. If you're a junior, you're still learning. But actually having that image there and seeing it is more a, sort of a very powerful kind of union. Um, and I think visual language, like it's especially in sort of that domain, really takes off. Especially when you've got a patient there who yeah. also needs to understand it. Yeah. They? yeah, I draw diagrams a lot, sort of point to things and say, oh, this is what we're doing and this now. Ah, oh, OK. Mm. And then suddenly you've got that that rapport and that understanding and the frustration sort of dies down a little bit, hopefully. And it's mm. a space, the, the visual image is a space where you can negotiate, can't you, if you have understood mm. each other or if you're actually understanding mm. slightly different things. I think that space between the visual image and the spoken word is really interesting mm. in how you used to, I don't know, rejuvenate both in a way. I'm um, coming back to our module that we did, the medical humanities module, the leg module, um, which uh, Deborah mentioned I took part in in my final year. And I loved it because it was a blend of medical students and arts and humanities. And there was some sort of border and this threshold that some people are crossing, sometimes not, and you're going into one are you going into the other? And the language used was different when we were describing what we saw physically and different images of, I think, because the topics was legs, various legs that you were seeing. How would you describe this leg? And then, you know, the medical student, oh, you know, there's atrophy, so wearing away. Someone said, and a, and a humanist might say, it looks a little smaller. I'm like, yes, yeah. So, so you mean the same thing, but you have that shared space, different way of expressing. And it's really nice. talk, talk about communicating is when, when both cohorts started, they were very threatened by each other. So the medical students were really threatened by the way that the arts and humanities students could talk about any line of literature or take it apart for mm. hours. And But then the humanities students were equally terrified by the medical and biomedical students because they thought they were all brilliant. They were all sort of geniuses and they were sort of awestruck by your sort of brains. And then eventually it was that thing with the language, wasn't it? The lang I think all your language changed mm -hmm. and, and became quite... Um, quite rich, quite complex, I think, in that mm. space. But I remember go back to your thing about caring. One of the ways in which the language was very evident when they're looking at specimens from the pathology museum, and we were talking about whether you call them pots or human remains or specimens and what what's carried along by that. And, and in fact, they are they are people's stories. There are people, um, you know, parts of people there who have lived lives. And I remember really strongly, actually, you looking at this this piece of foot I don't know yeah, how she's saying and you were so lovely because you you were talking about it actually in medical language you were talking about the person whose foot it was mm -hmm. and you were talking about um, they must have had so much pain to have whatever the condition was so it goes back to that care you were actually caring for someone who'd lived in the past and you were then coming you know face to face with if you like that was quite a moment for me actually because I felt like I was connecting with some of the arts and humanities students of a bit more than the medical ones, and I think people are like, yeah. So I think I said something like, um, I was talking as if it was my foot or the person and saying, you know, I'm hurting and so I've got these black bits on my feet and they're sort of spreading up my leg and mm. things like that. I, I think that was a good moment for me as well, being part of that. I think actually this is it's going to be interesting now that we're going to start talking more to City University because they are coming from totally different perspective. I, I had a chat with somebody from the law school um, two days ago, and this different use of language, different um, uh, focus on you know, their, I mean, they're going to have to try and explain what they are interested in, and we're going to have to try and explain where, where our interests are, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to come together somehow, and yet we talk different languages. 
you know, they have a law school, they have a business school. And it's also what you said about your expectations of people. You know, when you talk to doctors, you expect to be a bit bamboozled. Um, I think the next year or so chatting with them is going to be really interesting. Yeah, it'd be really interesting what happens in, mm. in that space and it is maybe everyone loses a bit of their defensiveness yes. or defending their own language mm. and actually really hears someone what someone else is really saying, mm. not what you're a little bit worried they're saying. And, and how those conversations go as you get to know each other more, like any interdisciplinary team. Yeah. Sue, yeah. so, so does that bring us full circle back to David's question? <laughs> 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 that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Around, I think, inclusion, and actually, we can use language to be inclusive, and that's what I think, Julie, you're talking about how we need to adapt our language to be inclusive and understand. And, mm. and, 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 but that actually quite often we use language to be to exclude. Yes, it's very easy to do that, isn't it? It's mm. a defence mechanism, it is. perhaps. Mm. You know, if you feel a little bit threatened, then if you revert to your tribe, mm. as it were, to your people you're comfortable with, and use the language of your. We do it in libraries all the time. You know, we've got our set of jargon that can protect us from feeling inadequate when we go to meetings or whatever. So I think it's it's interesting how we actually do need to use language to be inclusive. And maybe your example of groups of European people speaking English, they found a way to be inclusive. Mm. Whereas when we're participating in that as a native English speaker, yeah. we've got idioms and yeah. all of our kind of all of our baggage really that we bring with us and the way we speak, the speed at which we speak. Mm. You know, I, I've learned, lived in a foreign country and learned foreign languages and I was much happier speaking French to English people who were speaking French. There'd be much more chance of understanding <laughs> than I did speaking French to French people unless they dumbed it right down. So I think you know, they, they were using language as a way of excluding me, not purposely, and I don't know that we do it on purpose, but I'm just thinking of that sort of, you know, language. Whereas with music, You've not got, you've not got that barrier, but then it's open to your own personal interpretation. But it's not your personal interpretation, though, is it? It's the conductor. Well, I know you don't like conductors. <laughs> it's just I live with a conductor. So <laughs> so it is the conductor's interpretation, isn't it? But through all your instruments, but it is still a coming together for a sort of common good and the common sound that actually, as you said, is more than the sum of each of those individual lines, which maybe goes back to you, what you're saying again, and you're saying about the European um, English, is that there's a, a willingness for the greater good to overcome the barriers and really understand each other, rather than, you say, using language to exclude or to defend oneself or mm. boost oneself in some way. I think it's a, re a really interesting metaphor. But even music is interesting too, isn't it? Because we're used to the eight-tone scale. I mean, that's the, the so-called Western scale, isn't it? But there are so many other uh, uh, traditions using 12-tone scales, 15-tone scales. And um, so that's another sort of example. Of, and, 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 and that hasn't become mainstream music for some reason. So, you know, I think there's, it's interesting to think how music, music is not a universal language. We call it that, but it's not because people in India use different, totally different scales and intervals between their notes. Yes, you can. And then I'm thinking this is a very harmonious way to end. <laughs> no, no, Sue. It's just that you, the example of your boring talks podcast, <laughs> the fact that we should be open to hearing things that we wouldn't necessarily choose to hear. And I have to admit, I've never been to a scientific seminar, and I'm not particularly trying to go. <laughs> but that struck a chord with me in relation to work that you, Julian, have done here before with the prisons and the art, mm. and how that hugely struck chords in the quite unexpected ways when you built a prison cell outside the library and brought that artwork there. Mm. And what a and fantastic learning experience that was for lots of people, students, staff, and the public. When are you doing it again? <laughs> so I'm still going to prison every month and um, next year is our 10th year. So um, I was thinking of going for something again next year to celebrate that. Because it's, that's a real way of saying yeah. 
actually this isn't necessarily something that people know about or yeah. feel they care about until they are part of that. Yeah. And that's fantastic because that brings us back to caring again as well as language and, and understanding each other. So I'm really grateful to both of you for speaking and sharing your insights and yes, great wisdom and experience and humour. It's been really, really interesting hearing you and it's lovely having you back. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> and having Julian for the second time is a real treat. And thank you to all of those who appeared online. I know it's, it's a slightly different experience, but we're grateful to you.